I'd like to call the April 2nd West Melbourne City Council meeting to order and I'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting of City Council. Members of the public are welcome to speak on any topic, whether, and then we'll do the roll call after that, uh, whether it's on the tonight's agenda or on any issue that is important to you, each person that wishes to speak should complete a speaker card and submit it to the clerk. After you've been recognized to speak, please use the microphone on the podium and clearly state your name and address for the record. Please address all comments to the City Council rather than individual members. Direct all questions to this chair and speakers will be given up to three minutes. And ask the clerk to do the roll call, please. Mayor Bentley? Here. Deputy Mayor Adams? Here. Council Member Young? Here. Council Member Dittmore? Here. Council Member Frampus? Here. Council Member McDowell? Here. Council Member Volts? Here. And ask Mr. Cannon to come up to the podium and we'll do a proclamation. Whereas is to write, read out to you guys. Oh, you, yeah. All right, so uh, whereas water is a basic and essential need of every living creature, and whereas the state of Florida, water management districts, and the city of West Melbourne are working together to increase awareness about the importance of water conservation, whereas the West Melbourne and the state of Florida have designated April typically a dry month when water demands are most acute, as Florida's Water Conservation Month to educate citizens about how they can help save Florida's precious water resources. And whereas West Melbourne has always encouraged and supported water conservation through various educational programs and special events, and whereas every business, industry, school, and citizen can make a difference by saving water and thus promoting a family economy and community, whereas outdoor irrigation comprises a large portion of water use in this 26th year of recognizing Water Conservation Month. The City of West Melbourne specifically encourages citizens and businesses to focus on improving outdoor irrigation efficiency. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor of the City of West Melbourne, do hereby proclaim the month of April as Water Conservation Month and call upon all citizens and businesses to help protect our precious resource by practicing water saving measures and becoming more aware of the need to save water. Witness my hand on this second day of April, 2024. Congratulations. And you're with the St. John's District, and we'll give you a chance to say a few words. All right. I appreciate that. No problem. Or maybe I don't. I don't know. We'll find out here in a minute. But uh, uh, Mayor, Council, um, West Melbourne, thank you for this. Uh, we do these every year. This is the 26th year, as the mayor mentioned. Uh, it's the 26th year of water conservation, recognizing this, uh, recognizing April as, a, as an entire month to kind of focus on this important issue. Um, there's a special emphasis this year on leak detection. Uh, this is a great time of year to do it too. Inspect your sprinklers or your outdoor spigots, make sure they're not leaking any water. Um, you know, obviously with the influx of people coming to Florida, uh, fresh water has become even more important uh, and, and more precious a commodity, I guess. So um, this is just a good way to remind everybody, hey, just check your water usage. Um, we're all in this together. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for sharing. Thank you. And now, and now we're going to have our public forum. And I have one speaker card, Mr. Tony Martinez. 
from the FCA. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Um, Anthony Martinez at 774 Triple Crown Lane, West Melbourne, 32904. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is um, because I want to talk about that, that details make a difference. Um, I've been the All Abilities Director for Brevard FCA since uh, 2022, and we have been serving the uh, County of Brevard with the community of all abilities uh, for, the, for the last uh, two years. And in May, we will have one of our biggest events uh, right here in West Melbourne at the Space Coast Field of Dreams called Family Fun Day. And so um, when we think about this day and when we think about this event, um, this is a day that we get to raise awareness for the All Ability Ministry. We get to raise awareness for uh, the Space Coast Field of Dreams and we get to raise awareness for uh, the city of West Melbourne and the programs and, and uh, vendors that we have right here in the city to be able to help and serve uh, the all ability community. And the reason I say that details make a difference is because most people, when it comes to the all abilities community, they assume that they can't. But within FCA, we don't assume that way. We assume that they can. We assume that they can when they're given an opportunity to try and when they're given the space and the situation to be able to try safely and with the proper support around them. And so um, earlier this year, uh, we ran our very first um, All Ability Soccer League and we did this at a local elementary school. And um, we didn't know how many people would sign up, but we had 57 All Ability families sign up for our very first soccer league. And so we could have done this very easily, very, in a very basic way, and just provided them with a t-shirt and just kind of kicked the soccer ball around and you know, had fun with them for an hour. But again, the details make a difference. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to provide an experience for this community that replicates the same experience that they see their brothers and sisters have when they play soccer or when they play other sports. And so we gave them a soccer jersey, which I'm wearing today. We gave them soccer balls. And at the end of the four weeks that we played soccer and we did soccer drills, we also gave them Bibles. And so the, the coaches we had, uh, several of our coaches have played uh, professional soccer. We had many of our, of our soccer players come and stay and help out and be buddies for our, our all ability community. And then at the very end, we then brought all of those families to the Field of Dreams and we did a celebration with them where we gave them trophies and we took their picture and we celebrated them for what they, for what they did and for what they accomplished as all ability athletes. And so instead of them just having to watch their siblings get all the accolades, now they are the ones getting the accolades and getting celebrated. And it was amazing to have over 150 people at the Space Coast Field of Dreams between families, between staff, and between volunteers that just came to celebrate them and to celebrate this community that is often left behind, that is often forgotten, or that, that is often neglected. So consider this my personal invitation to every single one of you that is a part of this wonderful city council to come out on May 11th from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. at the Space Coast Field of Dreams and be a part of Family Fun Day. Last year when we did this, we had over 300 people attend. This year, our goal is to have over 500 people attend. And so consider this my personal invitation for each and every one of you to come out and to see what it's like when you focus on the details and you make sure 
that the details matter because these families, they see the difference that we're making. I had a mom that texted me a couple weeks ago and said, you know, we came out to your soccer league and we loved it. And a couple of days later, they went out to a different program with a different organization that was doing uh, baseball. And they said it was a completely different experience. They didn't have t-shirts, they didn't have buddies, they didn't, have, they didn't have volunteers, they were not prepared. And so they came out and they said, we see the difference that you're making and the details really do matter. So understand that when, when we try to do programs and we try to do the things that, that we're doing at the Space Coast Field of Dreams, we really do care about that facility, we care about this community, and we care about serving this wonderful city that we call home. So I would, I would also ask this council that when you're trying to get programs up and running, especially at this Space Coast Field of Dreams, give me a call, let me help. I have contacts, I have resources, I know people, I can get volunteers, I can get buddies, I can get coaches. Let me know, let me help, let me serve. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on, uh, wanna talk on any topic whatsoever? All right guys, last chance. Seeing none, we'll uh, move on to item six, which is our consent agenda. I need a motion. Mr. Dittmore. Make a motion to pass the consent agenda as presented. Someone hang in there and give us a second. Mr. Frampus. Second. So I have a motion from Mr. Dittmore, a second from Mr. Frampus. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, it passes 7-0. Flying right to our agenda. We're now at the action agenda and uh-oh, Ms. Fisher's not up. Ms. Fisher's on vacation, so we have uh, uh, Cindy from our planning department as well as our, um, as well as Denise for support. And um, Zach is with us uh, from Bowman, our engineering firm, so uh, we're gonna take this as a group approach and, and walk through this next agenda item. Floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Agenda item 7A is the final plot for the Greenleaf subdivision. First, a little bit of background on this project. Um, the preliminary plot for the Greenleaf subdivision was approved on February 15th of 2022. It is for 55 single family lots on 22.89 uh, acres of land. It's located um, sort of northwest of Carriage Gate Drive. In the final plat, there are two parts to it. The first part is a recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Board, and the second part is your decision for the City Council. This is the uh, representation of the Greenleaf plat. There is a right-of-way dedication that's going to be to Brevard County to extend Turkey Lake in this area, which was under size. That is approximately 0 0.01 acres in size. The access easement that is located on the plat here that gives access to the properties to the west of um, Carriage, uh, Greenleaf. There are two stormwater ponds. I have a ponds. question for you. Yes. Quick. Um, you're saying the section in the red dotted is the, the easement? Yes, that's an easement right here. It appears to be in the retention pond. Why? It, it's it's not actually in the retention pond. There's there's property along that re runs along that retention pond. It's 50. It's about 50 feet wide. And it runs right to the back of that house. Yep. And that that's the whole road. That's the easement. Yes. It's not a road. It's an easement. That eventually that can be used to access up to Turkey Lake for these properties that were here. If not. If there's not an um, easement granted, then they would be so landlocked. where's Turkey Place Road at? Turkey Place Road runs right here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
Albuquerque Place is right here. Access is going to be in here, and that easement's going to come right along in this area. I, I didn't mean to uh, mess you up on your That's thing. Okay. But how do the, well, how do the residents that live behind that development get to their property then? Do they run up the the south side of this property? They do, yes. These these right here don't have. Let me see if I can get to an aerial here. So they run the only one right now that's developed is this property here. Well, there's a trailer right towards the back middle of the property, and I was just wondering how they get access because I thought they were supposed to run to the south end of this property. And there are two easements actually. There is another easement that's going to be right where this little road right up in here. There's another access easement for the property that is. I'm just curious to how they get there now, because they used to go through that white line. It's right through the center of the property. How do they actually get back? Okay. Mr. Oliver, the developer, will address that. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Cole Oliver for the developer, EKS uh, Greenleaf um, LLC. To your question, there is an exi that, that is the easement that's being shown as an existing easement that's been on the property forever. So it's a legacy piece that was there when the property was bought. If you can go to the plat, there's a tract called OS1, um, which is the little dash section there, and that services the one trailer. Oh, okay, so they actually go there. through the property. Yes, sir. And come and out that's there. a stabilized okay. access point. I think so I remember that now that you now that you mentioned that. Property. So, the, okay, and thank you. And also the uh, the owner of the tower company to be able to get back there and service it as needed. Thank you. Did you give your address, sir? <laughs> I don't think you <laughs> gave the. Oh, yep, sorry, Cole Oliver, I heard you 516 name. Delanoi Ave, Cocoa, Florida. Thank you. Okay, there are two stormwater ponds uh, proposed on this um, final plat the, that will total approximately 7.09 acres. Their access easement, OS1, which is to the property here, that is 0.14 acres in size. The only one single entrance off of carriage gate drive there is a landscape buffer that's going to be along the edge of the property that is about 0.69 acres and then the lift station which is located right here which is going to be dedicated to the city is 0 0.04 acres a typical lot layout for a 75 by 120 which the most of the lots in this division subdivision are that size there's 52.22 acres that is going to be um, impervious on the site, which assumes a 20 by 25 foot driveway and a 60 by 70 building pad. The preliminary plat again was, was approved on February 15th, 2022. And in the preliminary plat going into final, there are two, two different processes that developers can go. They either prepare their construction drawings and construct the improvements, or they prepare the uh, construction drawings and post a performance bond. This one, they chose to install all the improvements. There were seven conditions to the preliminary plat. Of the seven, the first five, as you see here, these have already been met. And number six is, it was within 18 months, so it's like September 25th of 2025, they have to put that wall based upon the preliminary approval. The FDAP ha, um, has done their clearance on that lift station at this point. The final plat is consistent with the preliminary plat, and once the final plat is recorded, then that first lot can be sold. Uh, I, there were only six. Uh, there were only six. That's a typo on my part. The, yeah, the seventh was the lift station that got taken care of. Tract OS1, which is the one we were previously talking about, which is here, that is, pre as is a new access easement that's executed for the property south and west of the stormwater pond to access the internal public road for Viridian Circle, which is your primary entrance to the development. The analysis, the survey was reviewed and approved by the city surveyor, and he indicated that it is consistent with the Florida Statute 177. The engineering review was review, reviewed the construction plans and the cost estimate for bonding purposes. 
city attorney has done his legal review. The planning and zoning board have done their review and it's currently with the city council. Sidewalks are to be bonded and the properties cannot be sold until that final plat is approved. In our utilities, the subdivision is connected to the city sewer, our city water and sewer mains. The, new, the sewer line actually um, which was a condition of approval that has been met. They tested it yesterday and it passed its inspection. So it's ready to be um, deeded to the, count, uh, the city. Water capacity and connection fees are paid upon submittal of a building permit for each of the residential lots. Storm water, they did receive their St. John's River water management permit for drainage. Schools, there is sufficient capacity and that has been signed off by the school board. The recreation, they, the developers have paid their fee in lieu of the dedication of land that was received by the city on June 30th of 2023. Outside agencies coordination, um, St. John's River Management signed off, Melbourne Tillman has signed off on it, uh, Department of Environmental Protection has signed off, and the City of Melbourne Water Concurrency has signed off on it. So there we are recommending approval subject to the three conditions as seen on the, your report. I don't think we're required to, but does anybody from the public want to talk on this subject? And Mr. Thank Oliver you. is here to answer any questions. Well, I'm here to answer any questions, but also wanted to, one, thank the staff for doing a, a thorough but fair job on all the work. And um, just to let you guys know, the reason it took as long as we did is there's been a massive shortage of transformers out in the market due to all the storms that keep hitting everywhere. And um, we couldn't connect the sewer until FPNL could get a transformer. And um, that was an 18 month wait from the date we ordered it until install, which is typically a four month wait. So if you have any questions. No. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Frampus. Yeah, I'll make a motion. We approve the final plat for Greenleaf subdivision with uh, the three conditions as written. Ms. Waltz? I, I will second that, but I do have a question. Go ahead. And it's probably, I don't know if it's for you, but I, I had talked to Mr. Rohde about it. And that is the Axel Lane on Timinton Road is like barely enough for one car to be over there. Uh, is there any chance of getting that widened or something? We tried initially when we went through this process um, with the city the first go around and the access that had, I know it doesn't seem like it, but has been improved from what it was originally was the best that the county would allow at that intersection. And no possibility of a traffic light either? We tried that as hard as we could at the same time that the apartments were going in across the street and we did not find any approval. And that's up to the county, right? County road, I think it has to do with the distance between the existing lights right. and the standards. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kerry, you don't need to read the title on this, right? It's not an ordinance. That's correct. <laughs> Mr. Dittmore. <coughs> thank you, I, I was just gonna uh, just comment on that last question from uh, Council Member Voltz. Um, I don't remember who was all here when we had this, but this issue actually came up and it was the uh, folks at over at Carriage Gate that actually lobbied for that uh, that access lane, that lane that, uh, I forget what they call it, and you just mentioned it, but uh, the lane that they actually yeah. pull out, the acceleration lane, thank Excel you. Lane, yeah. They actually asked for that and they went to the county to actually get that. So that was actually done, uh, there was a movement to actually get that done. And the reason we were told about this so uh, a few years back is that they couldn't put a traffic light there because it was too close to the bridge, to the overpass. So because of the proximity of the overpass to the where they would want to put a light, it was too close and it was problematic. So um, they did lobby for that, uh, the folks in Carriage Gate, and they did get, they lobbied the county for that, and they did get that acceleration lane uh, put in. That's how that actually came about, so. Thank you. Any further discussion? I have a motion from Mr. Frampus, a second from Ms. Foltz. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, passes 7-0. Next item is an ordinance 2024-10 bid protest. Mr. Carey.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Finally got it working. Um, so this is an ordinance that um, I've drafted without your um, your uh, asking me to. Um, one of the mandates that I had when I was hired that uh, several of you, as well as the council as a whole, was to um, go through our code of ordinances and find what we could uh, do to improve it. And this is one of those items. Um, we currently don't have a bid protest ordinance in the city. This hasn't been an issue because the past 10 years, as you probably know, uh, oftentimes we have trouble finding firms who are even willing to bid on our projects. And because the private sector has been so strong over the past 10 years, if a, if a firm loses a bid, they typically walk away and go on to the next one because there are plenty of projects available and, um, and firms aren't you know, fighting uh, fighting each other for them uh, just because of the availability of the uh, the projects that are out there uh, between both the public sector and private sector. However, if there's an economic downturn, as we saw 15 years ago or so, um, the pu public sector generally continues doing projects and the private sector projects are few and far between. So all the firms that have been, um, you know, haven't been bidding on our projects will suddenly be bidding on our projects. One of the effects of that is it could drive down uh, cost of our projects, but the other effect is that if they lose a project, especially if it's a close, um, you know, you have two firms that are very close, uh, one of them can challenge it. And that is a right that they have uh, to challenge it. Without a bid protest ordinance, however, um, they can challenge it straight to the court system and we can't, you know, force them to um, challenge it locally. Uh, furthermore, if they do choose to challenge it locally, we don't have any procedures for doing that. Um, and, and finally, I would note that the ordinance allows us to, um, or requires the, any competing firm who wants to protest a, an award to put up a bid bond which requires them to put some skin in the game. It, right now, any firm that wants to challenge one of our awards can get a free bite at the apple, right? So uh, they lose, they can um, appeal it and come to you all to, uh, to try to get it overturned, and they don't have any skin in the game. They don't have to pay a, a dime to do that. Uh, the, the bid bond requires them to put up an amount, and it depends on how much the project is, that essentially they would get back if they're successful, if they identify uh, some sort of a, uh, an error that the city had in its uh, process, or um, you know, identify a, a problem with another contractor that we didn't identify, it, you know, something that, that essentially vindicates them, they would get the bid bond back. If they're not vindicated though, if we upheld hold the decision, uh, then they lose the bid bond. So essentially they have to, um, you know, put up money in order to challenge it, which is something that we would want because we don't want when the time comes and the economy goes down, which it probably will at some point, um, we don't want to be dealing with challenges continually because firms are just looking for work. Um, if, if there's a challenge that has merit, they can put up the money and, and uh, you know, and, and challenge it and we'll welcome that. Um, and. Uh, you know, by having an ordinance, we can require them to do it here, <coughs> which if they then appeal, the appeal would be um, based on the, uh, the materials and the information that's already in the record. So essentially, we kind of create a home field advantage um, if we do go to litigation by doing this. Uh, so uh, my recommendation, I do have to read the title because this is first reading, um, if, if you all are willing to move forward with this would be to approve the ordinance on first reading. Uh, certainly if you have any comments and uh, you know wanna discuss changes that you would like to make, we could do that and have them in place by second reading. Um, but this is one of those things that you know you all had asked me to do was to find deficiencies in our code and I think this is a rather significant one. It hasn't been an issue, but at some point it will be. And uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may read the ordinance. Yes. This is ordinance number 2024-10, an ordinance of the city of West Melbourne, Florida relating to bid protests, providing for legislative findings and intent, creating chapter eight, article one, sections eight-51 through eight-57, providing for bid protest procedures, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification and scrivener's errors, and providing an effective date. Thank you, sir. Ms. Waltz? Yes, <coughs> excuse me, um, I will, um, vote to approve ordinance 2024-10, but um, 
I was talking to Mr. Rohde about this and it said uh, in here, any protest of the solicitation itself must be made prior to the bids being opened. And I thought, if the bids aren't even open, how do people even know what the bids are, right? Um, but he had a great explanation. So I don't know if anybody else had a question on that. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. Was that a motion? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so well, I'll second that and I do have discussion. Okay, go ahead, discuss. Okay, um, just two. So um, in that same kind of thought process, um, first, has there been a history? Have we experienced this type of incidents in the past? We have not since I've been here. Um, Mr. <laughs> Rohde may have some <laughs> information about prior to that. My, my understanding is that in the last 15 years, there have been maybe one or two bid protests. It is not a common thing, uh, but in my view, it's something that we need to be prepared for um, nonetheless. And we want to be proactive about something like sure, that. Sure, sure. Uh, did you have something to thought? Yeah, during, uh, dur during Morris's tenure here, uh, there was a, a bid protest that did come to the council. The council did, um, did rule that it, it wasn't a valid protest and, and the person was fine and we moved on with the project. But again, just this kind of goes back to it's better to have a process and not have it and not need it than not have a process and wish we had one. And I appreciate the proactive approach to that. So to follow up on that, um, I'm looking for the adverse impact of this. Uh, is this the only remedy? So there's a doctrine of law called exhaustion of administrative remedies. And essentially that requires any, um, anybody that comes before the local government to go through the local process before they go to the court system. If they go to the court system, having not gone through the local process, the court will kick out the, kick the case back down to us, require them to go through our process, and then it would go back up if they challenge it. So any firm that is aggrieved by our decision even after we go through this process, can still sue us. Um, uh, you know, just to make clear, this doesn't completely shield us from lawsuits, but what it does do is, is if staff made an error, you all can review that and determine if they made an error before it gets to that point, before it goes to the court system. Thank you. Dr. Deputy Mayor Adams. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> A quick question for the city attorney. In terms of um, how this ordinance would be presented for the city of West Melbourne, I know you said once or twice this may have applied in the past. Have we seen um, similar ordinances for other cities in Brevard? Have they been challenged recently that we know of? Not that I'm aware of, and bid protest ordinances are fairly common. I think we're probably an outlier by not having one. Um, a, a lot of smaller cities don't necessarily have them. Um, you know, most bigger cities will. And, and I think we're big enough that we should probably have one. Um, even small cities probably should. I mean, it's not difficult to have an ordinance. And if you have the ordinance again, all, all we're doing is protecting our interests here. Understood, thank you. I have no lights on, so no further discussion. All right, so on ordinance 2024-10, I have a motion from Ms. Foltz, a second from Mr. McDowell. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it passes 7-0. The next is a budget priority discussion, and Mr. Rohde, you're leading that, or no? I, I am, thank you, Mayor and Deputy, Dr. Deputy Mayor and members of our our city council. Uh, first off, uh, s uh, appreciate everyone's flexibility. We typically do these budget meeting, uh, budget um, workshops at five o'clock, but seeing that we had a, a short agenda, I had uh, reached out to the mayor and uh, spitballed the idea of, of just combining the two. Um, didn't wanna make everybody rush here to get at five o'clock and then have a short council meeting. So. If you'd rather continue with the, with the other process of having the budget meetings at five o'clock, um, uh, makes no difference to the staff. Uh, you know, we're here anyway, so uh, just trying something new. Uh, appreciate everybody's flexibility and uh, let me know offline if you'd rather 
uh, go back to the other way. Obviously, if we have a full agenda, we, we have the budget meeting so that we get it in and uh, give it its due time. Uh, with that, moving forward, I do want to mention uh, Finance Director Candace Blake uh, did have to travel out of state uh, for a family medical emergency, and we wish uh, her and her family uh, nothing but the best on that. Uh, otherwise, she would be joining. Um, I've uh, volun voluntold uh, Assistant Manager Tom Bradford uh, to man the computer screen as we uh, get into the last uh, part of uh, the process tonight, which is to uh, spitball some council budget priorities, uh, projects or policies. But before we get there, uh, the one thing we do want to take care of tonight is in your packet is our annual uh, budget calendar. Um, we have uh, done our best to coordinate that with uh, at the staff level to make sure those are valid dates and those are valid uh, meetings and uh, please, we just asked uh, that the council take a look at that. Um, if there's any issues with that calendar, if you see a glaring error, or if you see something that um, it, it might not work, uh, obviously, if you're taking vacation or, or out of town, you know, we'll, the the show will go on. Uh, not not a big deal, but obviously, the big one is the two uh, two meetings where we uh, officially have the public hearings. To approve the budget and we uh, certainly uh, ask that everyone try to to make those and if you can't then uh, we're happy to uh, coordinate other meetings to make sure that we can have a full city council so august 22nd, august 22nd you're out <coughs> you uh, Bolts has a question for you yeah no no not for him my um just on this thing i'm going to be out june 13th and june 18th I have a um, my our very very first family reunion in Pitts, Pittsburgh. God bless you. Um, and I'll be leaving on probably on the 12th and probably coming back on the 19th. So, Mr. Brody, do you want us to give these to you one on one yeah, outside of here? We, like I mentioned, if if uh, during this, you know, we have essentially from here to the end, we have a budget meeting just about every council meeting. So. Uh, obviously, some people may have to miss one or two meetings here and there, but uh, obviously, as we get to the end, that's the key: setting the setting the millage rate and then ultimately approving the budget. And so, I, I was thankful Miss uh, Volts did reach out and let me know the dates that she'd be missing. And if there's any other dates, uh, feel free to just reach out, and we'll make sure. Um, if there's enough people missing, we'll we'll rearrange. If not, um, uh, we'll work through it. So. Uh, budget calendar is, is the big item, and then our second of three items in our discussion tonight is our uh, my uh, uh, update here on our council priorities from last year. So as you recall, last year we spitballed, uh, I think there were 22 project policy ideas that came out from the full council. We did the infamous sticker drill and uh, posted the stickers and na uh, narrowed that down to the top 10 priorities. Uh, these are the top 10 priorities that were selected by the council. We then budgeted them into the 23-24 uh, budget and just uh, listed uh, along with the priority as a, just a brief update. Some of them have been accomplished, some of them are uh, well underway, and then some of them uh, relative to the park are, are kind of contingent on our ultimate parks master planning study, which will be done here in the next couple of months from our consultant. So uh, happy to answer any questions on any of the updates for the current budget priorities. If there are any, if there's not, that's okay. I'm available anytime. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Mr. Dittmore. Thank you. Um, I just, I know we talked at the last meeting about bringing something back about the uh, sewer plant. Is that something you'll bring to that, us? That we will discuss, to, you know, hopefully that'll be uh, tonight. Uh, Brian uh, from Jacobs uh, is meeting. He was uh, out of town for spring break and is meeting with a contractor to get a preliminary number just so we have a rough budget number, whether it's 1.5 or, okay, or whatever. But with no other comments, and again, any, go. Oh. Mr. Frampus. Are we eliminating number two now that, uh, are we just gonna change that to land acquisition? What, what? Uh, 
Yeah, we, we'll be able to adjust that. We did accomplish that goal of, of you know, we hired uh, Stan Tech to do that and they presented you guys with the study, but right. obviously that'll be shifting as we come into the, uh, with the last action and as we come into, you know, tonight's objectives and, you know, the clear message that we received was uh, look at acquiring two pieces of property based on the study. So we'll, we'll put that together, but, um, you know, they, they do shift as, sure. as things progress, so. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. And most of the items we addressed in the one-to-one -one in our lively conversation that we had uh, prior to the meeting, but I do have a question on the number three. Um, I just had the question of who, and I forgot to ask you that. I mean, because that was, uh, I think it looks great, and it's greatly improved, but where is that rest as far as the organization? Whose responsibility ultimately is for that? So we're, we were blessed when we hired uh, our new city clerk that she came with a uh, journalism, not journalism, a communications and uh, a, a social media background. And so, um, again, it's, it's, it's not one single item that helps get the word out. We, we re, uh, remodeled is the wrong word. We updated and redesigned our Facebook page. Uh, we have additional, I'm sorry, a website. Our, we have an additional Facebook page dedicated just to park uh, and rec activities. Uh, we've converted over the Friday memo to the Friday roundup and made it a much more uh, user-friendly uh, document to read and review uh, through constant contact. And so um, those are some of the elements that, that we were working on with this. In addition, working with the West Melbourne, or working with the Business Advisory Committee, they do want to uh, redo the business survey that we did about seven years ago. And our city clerk will be coordinating with them uh, working on some sample questions, and then we'll be uh, emailing out the uh, uh, about 2,000 uh, business survey questions to our, our current 2,000 businesses in West Melbourne as a way to communicate and, and mention a few of our methodologies uh, that we prefer to work with for them as well. Oh, I just wanted to mention that, uh, thank you, city manager, just want to mention that uh, I remember because that required like two or three stickers in that particular category that I had put that on there and several others had communicated. So good job on that. That looks wonderful. I think we've made a huge uh, stride in the right direction. The other one that I want to emphasize that I think is really uh, important is that it seemed like since I uh, first uh, got on the council, there was this sense of, no, there's nothing we can do about Rosetter County, and it's nice to see that we're gonna have improvement on number eight. So that's a huge uh, uh, attaboy to whoever the attaboys are on that one. Thank you. Well, the city staff will take all the attaboys we can get. Yes. So without further ado, the fun part of this evening, so this is a two-step process. The second step of this process will take place next council meeting. Um, we will have a list and we will figure out a process for the council to prioritize. But tonight is the, uh, the goal for tonight's, uh, the rest of tonight's meeting is for the council to spitball any projects, any policies uh, to get those out there. Um, you know, try, you know, the goal is not to beat them up and, and second guess them. The goal is to just get as many out against the wall, if you will, as we can. Um, and obviously if there's some, if some clarification is needed, we can go down that road. But, but the goal is really to kind of throw out projects. And um, as Councilman Dittmore mentioned, one of the items that's been discussed a few different times since I've been here in my time um, was improvement of the, uh, the sewer plant aroma and the neighborhoods around the sewer plant. Uh, or the, the, the sewer plant is not going anywhere. It is a uh, over $150 million fixed asset that is always gonna be located where it's at. Um, but uh, are there anything that, you know, from, from small items to large items, are there any items we can do to help improve the 
uh, the odor uh, or aesthetics around that sewer plant. So that's one item. And then, as mentioned uh, several times out of our workshop, uh, the looking into the acquisition of, of land uh, relative to fire stations uh, based on the fire study that we did were two items that were talked about. But with that, I will turn it back to you, Mayor, and let you lead this uh, discussion. Deputy Mayor Adams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rowdy, for the, the review of the goals. I think it gives us a good uh, starting place to look at. A couple things that I had noted uh, just as I went through the agenda. Uh, I know in the past, at least in the two years that I've been on council, uh, every year we talk about a potential uh, sweeper update or something for the Hollywood Estates people. So I think that should be at least back on our consideration list uh, since it does involve uh, quite a bit of our, our West Melbourne residents. Uh, additionally, I know you and I have talked multiple times about looking at expanding uh, the communication out to residents to include something like a video capability or something that you know, continues to improve that communication. I think the website refresh looks great, uh, but the research tells us that people generally now are looking at uh, photos and videos more so than they're reading things. Uh, and while we want to continue communicating that, I think you also have to meet people where they are, so I wanted to bring that up. Uh, and then a note on looking at pedestrian safety elements. We, I brought up the crosswalk ideas. I know we were going to research into what the county was potentially going to allow in terms of the roads that do impact West Melbourne, uh, but I would like that to be a consideration, please. That's Thank you. That's another good one, yeah. I'm just curious, Ms. Adams, what are, they don't currently sweep Hollywood Estates? They have the sweeper that goes through. We sweep it, but there's no curb and gutter. There's no right. any kind of raised gutter okay. at Hollywood Estates. And so it it pushes it, but it doesn't grab it. So, okay. so I don't know if we can look at potentially other technology or an updated equipment piece, something that'll help them. Get an iRobot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Young? Um, yes, I just wanted to um, to add on to that that I've been asking for this for Hollywood Estates every budget year. I think that I've been on. We've been asking for Hollywood Estates to to be um, to have these same um, street souping that, that other places have. One time I mentioned, and I believe that you were here. Um, if any of us are from up north, I'm sure you've seen the roller, the roller type snow, when they remove snow, it's a roller, a little vehicle there. I asked if there, if any of the companies had had anything like that, where they could roll and kind of sweep the, the dirt away, because it's sandy and it really is terrible for them when they're out walking, when they're on bikes and that kind of stuff, and you get into a sand pile, it really is something I just wanted to add on to what Dr. Adams said, and just, you know, it's really important that we take care of that, so very important. And on the reuse water um, odor, when we put the um, odor eaters, for lack of a better term, when we put the odor eaters out here, and I know that we lease that every month, and it, it's... I think it's it's over three thousand at the time. I don't have I have no idea what it is now. And we had talked at the time about doing that in other places. There also the lift station at Sylvia and Henry. That is very fragrant when you go through there as well. And uh, fragrant, yes, fragrant. And um, yes, and the uh, the bouquet, <laughs> the bouquet when you get down at the reuse plant for the people there that live right in that area right there, it certainly would be nice. And we talked about it on this council before, and I thought we had approved it already before, and I thought it was already in line somewhere. Yeah, we currently have two uh, odor control systems uh, in the in the city of West Melbourne, and in your uh, very good memory, they cost about thirty six hundred dollars a month uh, to operate and maintain under our agreement. And one of them's at the sewer plant, and one of them is here at the lift station, uh, right to my. If I get my orientation, it, 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 right, right. Hen, Henry, <laughs> Henry and Mitten, uh, our biggest lift station. That's where the uh, the other is located, and so. Uh, happy to look into more locations and and cost and um, you know make that up if that if that's a priority make that happen so that would be for me and also the um, um, crosswalk so more that we can get that light up when they push the button and really make a spectacle the the better I think we should have them at every opportunity that we possibly can in West West Melbourne people are out walking and biking so that is a um, vision zero don't run over our residents. Thank you. Mr. Frampus. 
on the um, lift station uh, smell odor odor eaters uh, Frank, <laughs> um, is it not cost effective for us to purchase them outright if we're going to maintain them forever yeah we've we've looked into we've looked into this process before and I'm, I'm happy to take another look um, we're, we're done we're done <laughs> Is it dinner? Is it dinner time? Is it 1045? Um, yeah, it, it is typical that you you do hire a service to do that. That's what 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 actually happens. So maybe I can. So, so yeah, I, I'm happy to get information out to the council on what goes into that process. But it's it's obviously thirty six hundred dollars a month is not a, um, you know, small. It, 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 we say odor eaters. Obviously, it's a, an entire. It's an entire odor capturing device that gets maintained with chemicals on a regular basis, and so, so it gets serviced every it, month, it, and they're out there. Yeah, it's it's more like a muffler system than a odor eater. We, the, you know, the joke odor eater. We even use that joke at City Hall, but it's uh, happy to get you some pictures and show you. It's a, it's an actual device that we lease from a company. I would just like to see it. You know, as far as us purchasing our own and maintaining it ourselves as opposed to having somebody do it on a if we're going to keep them forever and if we're even going to expand that it might be better if we train our own people on it um, I had a question uh, is it appropriate to put the the sign that we approved either last year or the year before out in front of City Hall on this list because uh, I know you said you were holding off until the building got built but I mean yep, yep. I, please what but, sign? But yes, it will when we, uh, as part of. What sign? There was a digital sign approved for out in front of City Hall two years ago. <laughs> it, it was, it was, and it's just not. You mean, so are you talking about across the street yeah, or here? At City oh. Hall, where they're going to put the new building, I guess oh. they decided to hold off to put the new sign up. <clears throat> oh, okay. Several, long time. <laughs> so. Um, awesome. It's on the list. Thank you. Ms. Fultz. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The other day, well, multiple times, I've seen people, and we're talking about crosswalks, there's uh, uh, at the Wingate in Hollywood, there's people that are coming from the church right there, practically at the corner. And evidently they uh, live in Westbrook and they're walking across the street dodging traffic and there's no light I mean there's a light there but there's no um, no device that would stop them stop the traffic and allow them to go through um, and I've seen that on multiple occasions people walking from the church across the street uh, onto Wingate onto the sidewalk there so and, and I know there's one at the Florida Avenue there's you know a crosswalk there for the school kids and stuff um, but I don't know if the church there has a school and maybe those kids um, live in Westbrook I don't know um, but anyway I've just seen multiple times people walking across that northern side over there um, okay. Yeah, I don't think there's a sidewalk on the. There is not. West side of Hollywood. No, there is not. So typically, and 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 we could, you know, let let's put that down as a project. We'll, we'll you know, happy to investigate it. Um, again, uh, typically you only have what we call actuators if there's a, the a proper. ADA acceptable landing site on the other side for them to go to. Otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, it becomes kind of an intersection of cross at your own, yeah, at your own desire. So I know, um, and also the good idea. There's a a sign there, and of course the sign is down now, and it says there's a traffic light. You know, the sign is like it's laying down, so somebody needs to fix it. Um, it's on the west yeah, side ho of Hollywood. Hollywood and it's on Hollywood Boulevard, just north of Wingate. The sign is down, <clears throat> or most of the way down, I should say. Um, 
And then um, the sidewalks in Westbrook, not uh, they're on Wingate. They are a total disaster, and they really need to be fixed. So that's another good one. Yeah, we've okay. we're we're out. We're spending about one hundred and fifty thousand this year on sidewalk repairs. <laughs> Um, and so again, we're happy to continue to find areas that need sidewalk repairs and, and tackle them. You know, it's, it's the, the item to keep in mind with sidewalks is we just don't have enough budget and manpower to do all the sidewalks in West Melbourne at the same time. We, we just kind of uh, pick at them and get them done. But Mr. Dittmore. Thank you. So I uh, just want to make a point about the uh, issue there at Wingate and Hollywood. Um, in 2022, we had the opportunity to, myself and I think Ms. Adams and Michelle, we were walking the neighborhoods in 2022, and we uh, ran across someone that we were unaware of the county project. It was a complaint about a county project where apparently they're going to shift and I don't know if this is still, Mr. Rody. I don't know if you know or have knowledge of this, that the county is, if they're still planning on doing it or not, but Florida Avenue is supposed to shift somewhat and then go up to Wingate. So I think that to Ms. Bolt's concerns, I don't know how long that's going to be down the road that that's going to take place, but there's going to be a major, if, if that's still on track. So, so good news. Um, Hollywood continues to be designed and they are working very hard at the county level to get the final 100% engineering plan with a 100% cost estimate. The bad news is Hollywood, the funding for Hollywood has continued to drop on the county's priority list. And so with all energy focused on Ellis, uh, the Hollywood road has, has we'll say slipped down the county priority list. Somewhere down around the Eber Road, yes. Captain Barrel oh, list, some, anyways. When, when Eber gets completed. Yeah, yeah so, I, so the point is I think that uh, in that situation, if it would be, if it's sped along properly, might resolve itself at that intersection when they redo and move that. Not quite sure how that's gonna look, but I remember there was, a, there was a church was looking to buy some property there and they ended up having to sell the property because they're gonna shift somehow another ship Florida to Wingate there, which will probably take care of some of those issues, I think. Yep, and, the, and that, the, that the county has a plan for that. And to, to that point, uh, obviously the county originally was going to do about a $60 million Hollywood re, you know, uh, Hollywood four lane. And so that would have included sidewalks on both sides of Hollywood from start to finish. So. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. We have currently a review process with our roads as far as uh, long term. We even put monies away and planning for that, correct? You are correct, sir. And then uh, every year we go through an evaluation process of the roads. So um, uh, our staff, along with consulting engineers, drive the roads and rate them in uh, in a kind of a one through five uh, system, and that's how we evaluate uh, our, yeah. our road priorities. This is a set of questions, so it's not about the roads. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's actually about these sidewalks, and I think that we need to build on it, and I appreciate now I've heard three of the, my fellow council members refer to the sidewalks, maybe even four, about, you know, there's interruptions in the sidewalks, there's planning, there's replacement. Is there not, instead of doing it a piecemeal and, you know, and having three, two different bullets with three sub bullets, shouldn't we be to doing a comprehensive review of that? And, and funny that you asked that. Um, What's not that, a plan? That, that is part of our uh, parks, uh, comprehensive uh, parks plan was a, uh, a sidewalk gap, what they call a gap analysis uh, to help find where we have good walkability and then it just stops. And so how can we tie uh, the sections of good walkability together to, to make the whole community walkable? Along with the replacement process and stuff like that. Along with the so replacement, yeah. Comprehensive, long-term, and they're not going anywhere. 
right? N no, and and thankfully, sidewalks last uh, okay. do do much better here in Florida than other parts of the country uh, without the frost and thaw. However, um, they don't last forever. Mr. Dittmore. I just want to add, uh, probably just a question for Mr. Carey. Do we, the city, have the same liability for trip and falls on raised sidewalks as the private communities do? Yeah, I mean, certainly anytime you have a raised sidewalk, it creates a liability issue because. Okay. So that being said, uh, what method of, uh, I guess, do we have to be put on notice to be liable for that? Or is that something? Yeah, they, they're, before somebody files a suit, they have to file a claim with the city um, uh, with, uh, with basically where they're asking us to pay the claim um, and noticing us that they'll they intend to file. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I I, I, I should have meant the, I was talking about like the notice of there being an issue. Do we have to have notice there was an issue that we neglected to take care of, or just happens to be just has to exist before we become liable? In order for there to be liability, generally the city would have to be on notice uh, that there was some um, defect in the product, uh, the product being the sidewalk. However, you know, the notice doesn't have to be actual notice where, you know, somebody has, there's record that an email has been sent to the city and we ignored it. Um, if, if, if a court or somebody determines that the, uh, that the city should have been on notice had we been doing our due diligence, that's sufficient to uh, create a, a liability for a lawsuit. Okay, so there brings my last question to Mr. Rohde. Do, <laughs> do we have a process, I know we have people walking the sidewalks, but what process do we have in place to uh, spot check or do we do anything? So how yep, do we do that? Absolutely, so our, our um, streets and drainage crew uh, is often out uh, when somebody does call, uh, they do respond. We have looked at several sidewalks, uh, including some of the ones mentioned tonight, a and there's varying levels, right? So we have trip hazards, um, if they're minor trip hazards, we do have the equipment uh, and we do grind, what we call grinding the trip hazard. Uh, again, there are, there are uh, DOT, FDOT specs for sidewalks. So just because there's a, a little, you know, I'll, I'll over exaggerate, a 1 16th uh, lip on a sidewalk does not qualify it to, you know, uh, be a trip hazard. So there are uh, different specifications that we go by. Another item that comes up a lot is there are cracked sidewalks, but those cracked sidewalks don't have any raised edges. And so again, they're not a trip hazard uh, by FTOT spec. So we, we work through our manual and adjust, and then we I identify one um, sidewalks that uh, if there are, again, not to go too deep in the weeds, but if they're grindable, we grind them. If there's uh, very intermittent uh, broken sidewalks that need to be replaced. Our crews are able to do that. If it's a uh, multi-slab section of our community like we have and we're doing now in a couple of different areas, uh, then we do identify that, get a contractor out there and have a contractor do it. We just can't tie up. Again, our streets and drainage is an eight-man crew and uh, you know, there's can't tie them up for a whole month doing one section of a sidewalk. So. <clears throat> Ms. Fultz? Yes, on that very note that you were talking about, um, I was walking with a couple of friends and the sidewalks in Westbrook Park, their city, correct? Correct, that park is a city park. Okay, um, there was a quite a large gap in the sidewalk and every time we would walk, I would always remind everybody there's a big lip here so be careful well one time we were just talking and she tripped and fell ended up in the emergency room I think she broke her arm messed up her face um, of course she was not going to do anything about it you know but she never walked with us again so that was kind of very disappointing but then I did call Andrea at the time because she was on the council and I wasn't and she had it all shaved and we still walk, but she's not, this other lady is not with us. She's scared to death of walking. Yeah, we, we, you know, 
since I have been here, we've probably gotten a dozen calls about uh, cracks in the sidewalk. Of those dozen calls, probably half of them are county and the other half are ours. And, and, and the ones that are ours, you know, our crews go out. If it's, if it's something that needs to be totally replaced, we put the cones up and we put a sign that says the uh, sidewalk's closed, just like the county does, just like uh, most municipalities do. And if it's something that we can grind, we actually did purchase the equipment to grind surprisingly expensive but um, that's a different topic uh, we did purchase the grinding wheel um, and we we do have that ability to grind those edges mr. Francis <clears throat> maybe just for something to think about in the future is uh, putting a notice out uh, in the newsletter or whatever that if if anybody has it maybe report it and uh, let us know and we can get to take care of it because just like Ms. Vault said it, they know about it. Unless they reported it, we wouldn't know about it. So uh, there's an importance to yeah. To the, know. the the infamous Westbrook Community Park. There's always uh, conversation about whether that's city or or HOA. That comes up a lot. Deputy Mayor Adams. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, real quick note in terms of I know some of these priorities will probably continue forward because they're projects that still need to be finished. Uh, but in terms of projects that we continue to look for grants for or advocate at the state level um, i'm assuming but i don't want to assume uh, we're going to continue going after flood risk reduction projects and, and moving that forward yes yeah so hopefully the governor keeps our our two uh, flood risk reduction uh, items for this year in the governor uh, in his in in the budget uh, and doesn't veto them uh, we will continue to chase them we are the big project that staff is working on with uh, ISS, our engineering, one of our consulting engineering firms, is the Westbrook study. As, as many of you are aware, we had the big public meeting uh, about a year ago here in this room and talked about kind of a preliminary redirection for the solution. That report has been finalized. Uh, again, a lot of effort went into it, a lot of detail, uh, working with the um, um, uh, Melbourne Tillman District and we now have a draft report it's about to be final and we'll be again we're reaching out to the community having that meeting and talking about solutions but as you can imagine some of the solutions uh, are going to be costly and so we're, that's what we're trying to identify now is is which what what's our biggest bang for the buck for that neighborhood and then uh, funding sources to go for that, so. Sounds good, I just wanted to make sure it stays on there. Thank you. And I did have a couple items, but I think they've actually been hit pretty hard already tonight. Um, I would be personally open to any additional sewer plant improvements that could be made, uh, even on a larger scale, but I know you have some already in plan. Um, how much are those crossing lights that are solar powered on, are they like 1500 each or something? Um, a good rule of thumb for anything that we purchase right now is $5,000. Yeah, I personally would like, I think there's actually, people do see those when people hit those buttons to cross. Uh, so if we have other intersections or streets that could take advantage, I, w I want to move a little bit more into, for at least my input, into the safety direction this year. Uh, to make, I think we're not known right now for being bike or pedestrian safe. I don't think Brevard County as a whole is, is good there. So if there's additional sidewalks we could put in, is there the possibility of hiring a company to put in sidewalks for us so that we don't tire up our staff? Yeah, we if we were to do, let's say we were to pick a, um, you know, a quarter mile section that is a gap between current sidewalks of one subdivision and current sidewalks of another subdivision. That would be something we would we would definitely bid out and, and contract. Just to, to go back one one item, uh, Mayor, uh, are you looking for the signs similar to the ones we installed on Henry? Okay, I think yeah, so. Yeah, those are those are about fifteen hundred apiece. Yep, and That's it just seems like they really light up well. They hold a charge, so they light up at night as well. They don't have electric to them, right? Isn't it just solar? No, those are yeah. Those are all solar powered. Those are we we have, of of some of the solar some of the solar items we've installed, we've had a little bit of growing pain with. 
those particular units have not had any growing pain. Right. So for you could put 20 in for not much money, for example, and and I think that would go a fair way of helping the safety. So I'm I'm open to sewer plant improvements or changes. I'm open to obviously the things on the other list, but you're talking about are they the yellow flags? yes yes do, do they have to be yellow can they be red they, they cannot I, be red or blue they uh, cannot absolutely not be I red can, uh, yeah. not pay as much attention to yeah. the yellow lights as the red ones. i'm not a light color expert well, i should be but i'm not a, yeah. an expert on what color so i just like the idea that they're up there at intersections throughout the city and i think actually other cities would even notice if we had those more pronounced throughout the city yeah, yeah, yellow, primarily on henry road those worked out very well. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were talking more of the ones like on, uh, no. how, you know, A1A down Beachside where you light up and it okay. lights in like six or different. And yeah, and, and, and that's why I say 5,000 because now you're, you're talking electricity and, yeah. and no. infrastructure. The ones that we put in um, uh, on Henry were the standalone poles. Obviously, we installed the poles, but once the poles are in and you push the button, the solar power charges, uh, and then they flash yellow pretty aggressive, and they, they've, they've gone over very well. We haven't had a lot of issues with so those. So anywhere throughout the city, you know, I'd be, I'd be okay with putting 20, 25 of those are just not that expensive, and I, and I think it would go a long way to, to keeping our city safe, and especially since, you know, those are problem areas throughout the county, and so, that's all I had, Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a process question, not necessarily about this. And the process of, um, which I think was great, and I missed the stickers, by the way. That's uh, that's next week. Okay. It, or next that's, time, if you uh, want to use the stickers. So I know I'm just I'm just uh, being facetious. The uh, question I have is about prioritizing and figuring out from a Gantt chart perspective timeline what's concurrent because. And that got triggered when I heard Dr. Adams say, uh, you know, it's on here, where is it fall, and it, will it be, you know, worked on? And that's a good point, because we could be looking at this time next year, well, you would be looking at it <laughs> next year, and saying, well, we didn't get those uh, mitten in uh, 192 completed, but it's on the list. So will we have an opportunity to prioritize it so that way we can make sure that we feel that we collectively want these things to be looked at first. Next meeting. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. I'm sorry, we done? Ms. Young? Thank you, Mayor. Um, also on um, on Wingate, the solar powered flashing your speed is, I yes. think those have been very helpful. It gets my attention. Um, I think they've been very, very helpful. And I know the people from Heritage Oaks were in here and they were quite concerned about the speeders because that's a nice straightaway on Heritage Oaks. Do you think we could have them for Heritage Oaks Boulevard as well? I, I think those are great. We, the speed trailer is extremely flexible and allows us to drop it in uh, in key locations. The problem with the speed trailer is this, the curse that every community that I've been at, we've had the speed trailer, they don't, they don't last. They, they are kind of a, a maintenance nightmare. And so um, absolutely, we, we're happy to, you know, maybe the, maybe the solution instead of the speed trailer is uh, I know we're we're I know we are looking into some speed trailer options for for not the police the, department because our trailer. current speed trailer uh, yeah it just not the trailer the actual solar powered right. permanent light yeah and, and those have been good for us we we did have a little bit of growing pain with um, some of the battery uh, some of the battery retention and and uh, took a little bit of time to. Uh, master those, but we, we've got our arms around those much better now. All right. Thank you. Mr. Frampus. Tom, can maybe we modify that speed sign thing to uh, include Heritage o Oaks, but maybe evaluate other areas in yeah. the city instead of... Do, do we... Yeah, so just, just a, a big picture. We can evaluate it off of speeding violations or we can evaluate it off of traffic accidents. Those are two common. Is there a th third bucket that jumps out at you, Chief? To evaluate if we were to look at, you know, what statistic would we be using to 
gauge that. I know there was a lot of complaints about Norfolk Parkway and, and all those also, so I didn't know. Those are the main things we use, but I've also had experience, you know, every neighborhood raises issues or, or several do that, that come up. Um, and I've had some success in the past with some mobile signs that are able to be moved around a little bit too. So that's one of the things not to get ahead of any budget things, but uh, that I've been looking to propose to the manager for inclusion in the budget was uh, some additional flexibility that we can hit a neighborhood for a few weeks and then we can move it to another neighborhood because sometimes over time they lose their effectiveness. But when they're, when they're, they're hit, they're reminded, kind of like a squad car sitting in a certain neighborhood for a few weeks, people eventually go back to their old habits, but then when you kind of reintroduce uh, awareness to it, you know, it kind of changes behavior again. So I've had some success with those in the past. And then when we get complaints uh, from certain neighborhoods, you can also use technology like that to actually measure um, the actual speeds, even without it displaying. So, you know, a speed trailer, sometimes it really shows, people see a speed trailer and they think it's gonna show their speed, whereas these are a little bit more, uh, they don't stand out as much, so you're able to really get a good view of speed without affecting driver behavior and determine is there really a problem there. So uh, the, the software that's available on some of these does great analysis and, uh, um, you know, live from the field reporting that we can sit at the desk and see what's happening in certain areas. So certainly something we'll be happy to look at. So they're different, those portable units are different than the portable speed trailers? They are, yes. Okay. Yeah. Very similar statistical data, but they can literally be put on a telephone pole, a utility pole. Uh, they, they have a bunch of different mounts that you can uh, move them around much more easy. So. I think we're telling you it might fit in the budget. <clears throat> we're looking at it. So. I think once they start forgetting uh, their speed when the signs are still there, write a few tickets and they'll remember pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, <laughs> Three E's, education, engineering, and enforcement, right? That's the three that uh, help slow, th slow things down, so. Well, I know we, we do a lot of warnings, which is very nice, but when that flashing sign is there and you know what the speed you're going, I, that should be your warning. I would think, you know, I'm not the officer. I know they have discretion, but I would think that flashing sign would be your warning and, and now you get the ticket. Yep. But that's up to you. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, Safety, again, is something I'd like to see a focus on, so I think you guys hear that. Um, Mr. Rohde, did you get everything you needed? Uh, th this is your guys' part. If I think we are, got it. What if we're there are additional next. items, we're happy to add them. Yeah. Um, if anybody has a better uh, mouse trap uh, for uh, than stickers, we are all ears. We, uh, that's kind of a traditional method that's been used to help prioritize items, but if there's, uh, you know, if we'd rather, uh, you know, we're happy to work with any process you guys have an idea for. So for the next meeting, you guys in the next literature that you put out uh, the day of the meeting or the day, the weekend before the meeting, you're going to list all these items in there and then we can come in prepared on that Tuesday to prioritize, prioritize. the list that you have. And if someone wants to add an item, Yep, Obviously there's that's always your time chance. to add them. Yep, we, we've, you know, you guys have always uh, allowed that flexibility to add those items if some new idea comes up. All right, thank you, sir. So I will conclude the budget priorities and move to city council reports. Ms. Andrea Young. No report. Mr. McDowell. Ms. Fultz. Um, well, I would like to congratulate Ms. Dr. Diana, and um, ask what your degree, doctor degree is in? It's a doctorate in public administration and policy. Awesome, congratulations. That is, a, that really, that's awesome. That's Ms. all I have. Ms. Adams, Deputy Mayor Adams. Thank you. A <laughs> uh, couple things to note, uh, after the last meeting, I actually, uh, drove up a little bit past uh, St. Augustine. I was selected as uh, one of seven members of the Florida Municipal Loan Council to represent the state for the League of Cities where we evaluate projects that come forward from the city level uh, for different loans. And West Melbourne will actually be uh, putting one forward. So I'll be stepping back from that vote. Um, but well, other than that. No, we're not. No, you know, uh, let's well, talk, we, let's talk. We, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We know how we can get. 
But um, it has been interesting looking at how cities are submitting for different loan projects, uh, and it's not a program that typically at the league level they've seen a lot of cities take advantage of recently. Uh, so they've really been kind of reaching out to cities and saying, we have this loan program, we'd like you to use it just so that you know cities can benefit from it, but I'm sharing it with the rest of council because I know as you know, you have different contacts in different cities if they have projects that do need some type of loan um, and if they're part of the league, that might be something beneficial for them to look into. Um, in terms of other things, the BCSO held their award ceremony a few weeks ago and I thought it was very well done. Um, they specifically gave two gentlemen an award uh, for, uh, t it was the Medal Medals of Valor, I think that's what they're called. Uh, just for some really great action that they've taken in the county uh, in terms of life-saving action. So I thought that was pretty great in terms of their action. Uh, lots of other people were recognized that evening, but I thought that was a, a notable one. Uh, most of us attended the West Melbourne Business Association and Council uh, joint meeting the other day. So I thought that was well attended. I think the general message from that group is they would like to see more growth um, just in the WMBA, but also supporting businesses in West Melbourne. So I think anything that we can do as a council to reach out to, especially as you know, we have ribbon cuttings for new businesses coming in, encouraging them to get involved, I think would be beneficial. And then just a uh, invitation if council did not see, we are participating in KBB's Trash Bash again this year at the community park on Saturday, starting at 8 a.m. Uh, we typically are provided with buckets and the little tools to pick things up, which is great. It really saves your back. I like it. Uh, but if you would like to come and it's open to residents, we'd love to have people come and volunteer. Uh, but you might want to bring some extra gloves because I know last year we went through quite a few. So I just wanted to mention that because that's on Saturday morning. Where Thank you. The community park off Mitten, where the Field of Dreams is. Field of Dreams. Mr. Frampus. Um, I only have, I wanted to thank Mr. Rohde. Um, we had a tree issue on Norfolk Parkway that he took care of pretty promptly and uh, a limb had fallen down. And then we had gotten the arborist out there and they're gonna be removing the tree apparently. Um, uh, my only suggestion is maybe why uh, there seems to be quite a few dead trees along that stretch. I don't know if. Uh, Must be all the speeding. Yes, probably. <laughs> it's the, um, or the littering, that seems to be pretty bad too. So um, if maybe we can get a follow up yes. there. And uh, he was also pretty proficient on getting back to a resident that had a problem with a surveyor and stuff too. So uh, congratulations, thank you uh, for, for doing a great job. Oh, thank you, sir. Mr. Nitmore. No report. Thank you. There's a couple of comments. One, I, like everybody said, congratulations, Diana. I had the good fortune of hiring a lot of PhDs at Harris when I was there. I understand how hard and how long of a process that is. Uh, so really great job, congratulations, and uh, I think that's fantastic that you did that. Uh, and also, I'd like to see beautification as part of the thing on our plan that you were just recording a while ago for things like litter pickup and stuff like that make ours I don't think that costs a lot but it may take some labor to make our city a more beautiful place by you know especially I don't know if you can get around the interstate but throughout the city I'd like to see us put focus on safety and put focus on beautification so any management uh, just uh, I do have uh, one item and I know we have the KBB event on Saturday. We also have the uh, funeral service for Sean Morrison on Saturday. So many of the staff will be there uh, and, our, and our thoughts will, will be with um, Sean's wife, Tracy. Uh, and uh, second item, uh, real brief, uh, did have a meeting, uh, our monthly status meeting with our um, lobbyist, Mr. Herodopoulos. We are now shifting gears uh, with the coming to the final report from Hazen and Associates with our water plant, with our final design and cost estimate that they uh, should have to the staff here in the next month. Um, we are shifting gears now that the state budget is complete and starting to work on grant applications. 
uh, with Mr. Herodopoulos and his uh, firm. And one of the items that he uh, suggested is to, to reach out to our uh, state congressman. And so we, I will be, uh, assuming nobody has a, a problem with that, we'll be working with our lobbyists. I'll be reaching out to uh, our state congressman to start the process of uh, trying to apply for some federal grants for the water uh, for the water plant and so i just wanted to mention that out loud in case anybody does see our state congressman um, out and about and uh, he may mention that we're working on a water plant so i am talking about mr posey you said our state congressman. i'm sorry I, my apologies i'm sorry u.s congressman posey's office is who uh, we'll be working with to try to chase some of the big uh, federal grant dollars. All right, guys, we're adjourned.